<laughs> okay, so uh, welcome. This is the first in the 2021 fall uh, Far Hills Speaker Series, which is uh, held in conjunction with Wright Memorial Public Library and Oakwood Historical Society. And tonight we have Tim Gaffney. He is the author of Dayton Beer, A History of Brewing in the Miami Valley. And we are excited that he agreed to uh, speak for our series and I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, this is a, an odd book for me because most of my writing has been about aviation and space. Um, but uh, I, I got interested in the history of beer brewing when I noticed a few years ago as the craft beer wave started taking hold in Dayton that local brew pubs uh, were using local culture and history to brand themselves and their products. In particular, one that caught my attention was Warped Wing, uh, which named itself after the wing warping device invented by the Wright brothers. And that got me interested in the, this uh, tie between local history and beer brewing. And it made me start wondering, well, what happened to all the brewers that used to be here? Where did they go? And what started this new wave? So I started researching it and the result was this book, Dayton Beer, uh, came out in 2019. And so tonight I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about what I learned. Breweries were one of the earliest industries in the Miami Valley. Farmers needed grist mills and grist mills led to distilleries and breweries. This is a drawing of George Newcomb's brewery, uh, George Newcomb's tavern, Dayton's first permanent structure. He built it in 1796. Historical accounts say he added a brewery in 1809 or 1810. And it wasn't the first in the Dayton region. A local history of Springfield said its first settlers had a brewery by 1804. In Xenia, one account named a settler who built a brewery in 1805. And historical accounts of Piqua mention a pioneer distiller who also had a brewery between 1807 and 1812. Dayton might not have had the first brewery in the region, but it had the most by far. Over the course of the 19th century, in that time, Dayton's population grew from a tiny settlement to a city of 80,000, and the brewing industry grew with it. As I researched this book, trying to sort out which brewery was where got so confusing that I had to make a map but it had to be one that spanned a period of rapid growth and change. I used Photoshop to combine elements of several Dayton maps, a city map from 1869 and a collection of ward maps from 1875. Then I pinpointed the location of each brewery as well as I could. Now, some were actually marked on the maps, but others were only generally described in local histories. The result of what I did isn't perfect, but it gave me a good sense of where the breweries were in relation to their local surroundings and each other, even though they existed at different times over a century. The breweries marked Dayton's expansion across what's now the downtown area. And the early breweries formed a cluster right in the middle Here's Newcomb's Tavern and a brewery, the brewery was nearby. After Newcomb, Henry Brown had a brewery in 1820 on the west side of Main Street between second and third. It was Dayton's first brick brewery and it was later called the Dayton Brewery. It had a series of owners and in 1828, it was moved to a new building on the west side of Jefferson, midway between first and monument. In 1829, John Harry's brought his family from Wales to New York and from there to Dayton. They came by way of Cincinnati 
and they were among the first travelers on the Miami and Erie Canal. Harry's, Harry's bought the brewery and owned it until his death in 1873. It made him one of Dayton's longest serving brewers. His son Charles took over the brewery, but it closed after another four years. Another bre early brewer, let me see what we've got here. Another early brewer was James Riddle, a Pennsylvania native who was a mounted ranger in the Indiana wilderness in the War of 1812. He had a brewery going at least by 1840 on St. Clair Street near East Third. I wasn't able to learn much about him. I learned more about the brewer he hired. That was Henry Ferneding, a German who immigrated to Baltimore from around 1833. A few years later, he decided to come to the Miami Valley, so he set out on foot, walking roughly 200 miles from Baltimore to the Ohio River at Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh, he floated down the Ohio to Cincinnati. He moved to Dayton. He moved to Dayton and worked in a series of distilleries around the region before taking a job in Riddle's Brewery in 1840. Fernandig eventually bought the brewery and built a successful business with brewing, malting, and real estate. He became a local business leader and a major ben benefactor to St. Mary's Institute, or what's now the University of Dayton. His descendants funded his descendants founded the Fernanding Insurance Company, and the family still runs it. In January 1848, another German immigrant came to Dayton on foot in stocking feet, according to biographical sketches. Nick Thomas landed in America at New Orleans in 1847 and came up the Mississippi and Ohio rivers to Cincinnati. From there, he walked to Dayton in the winter with his boots on his back. The biographies didn't explain why he was carrying his boots in the winter. Maybe the boots were new and hurt his feet. Maybe he was saving them for rougher work. Whatever, he had grown up on a farm, so I imagine his feet were plenty tough. He only stopped in Dayton for a few weeks before trekking on to an uncle's farm in Decatur, Indiana. Eventually he returned to Dayton where he worked different jobs until 1880 or 1881 when he bought the hydraulic brewery out East First Street, East First Street at North Beckel. Thomas was in his mid fifties by then, which was old age in those days, but it was just the beginning of his brewing career. By 1906, Nick Thomas was a popular brand name and his brewery was Dayton's biggest. What was beer like in the middle of the 19th century? Early American brewers made ales and porters and their open kettles allowed wild yeasts from the air to grow in the brew and colonize the fermenting barrels. The result was often dull and sour beer. But the beer industry was changing. In 1859, Henry Fernanding moved his city brewery from Kenton Street to Warren. This picture shows the uh, city brewery on Warren Street. It was built for brewing a new kind of beer, one that had to be brewed carefully and then fermented and stored at cold temperatures. It was lager beer and its crisp, clear taste was transforming the beer industry in Dayton and across the country. Jacob Stickle later acquired this brewery and built his own legacy with it by brewing, as his ads called it, pure old lager. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bavarian brewers developed lager beer as early as the 15th century, but most historians say lager didn't reach the United States until around 1840 and it took a dozen more years for it to reach Dayton. By most accounts, Montgomery County's first lager was brewed here at the Wayne Street Brewery or the Oregon Brewery as it was first known. 
It was started by John and Michael Schimmel, two brothers from Bavaria. And historical accounts say they brewed the first batch of lager on De in December 1852. John Schimmel died in 1858. Michael Schimmel kept the brewery until 1892. It became known as the Wayne Street Brewery in the 1870s, and later brewers renamed it the Pioneer Brewery until it closed in 1900. The brewery is long gone, but it stood here at the corner of Hickory, just up Wayne, there's Wayne Avenue, just up Wayne from where Branch and Bone is today. This is Coalesced and Schwind. Coalesced and was one of four brothers who came from Bavaria in the late 1840s. The two oldest brothers, Joseph and Titus, immediately started their own breweries. Joseph built the Main Street Brewery, which you see here. Here's Main Street. Here's his brewery. <clears throat> Titus, for some reason, opened a brewery in Troy. Coalustin, the third brother, and Anton, the youngest, worked for Titus and then moved down to Dayton and worked for Joseph. But then in the early 1850s, Coalustin left Joseph and went to work for the Schimmels in their lager beer brewery. He worked there for 11 months, where later accounts say he learned the secrets of brewing lager beer. He quit to start his own business, the Canal Brewery, he only brewed common beer there, but in 1868, he began building a big new brewery on the west bank of the Miami River, just south of what's now Salem Avenue. It was called the Dayton View Brewery, named for the upscale new suburb that was growing up around it. The Dayton View Brewery produced lager beer. Lager beer, and later real estate, made Coalesten a wealthy man. And the Schwinns became one of Dayton's leading families by the turn of the century. In 1912, the 11-story Schwind Tower went up on Ludlow Street. It was one of Dayton's first high-rise buildings. It carried the family name for just over a century until it was demolished in 2013. The Schwind family is important not only because of what men did, Joseph Schwind married another immigrant from his hometown in Germany, Agnes Wenner. After Joseph died in 1867, Agnes continued to run the business until about 1882, when the Main Street Brewery seems to have closed. Agnes Wenner Schwind was the first woman brewery proprietor that I found in Dayton. Yet she received none of the recognition or credit that male business owners receive. I had to dig her story out of various public records. She was one of seven women brewery owners around the Miami Valley that I found in my research, and none of them were recognized in their time. Another was Coalesten's wife, Christina Lanton. She married Coalesten in 1856, early in his brewing career. Coalesten incorporated his company in in 1892, with himself as president and their eldest son, Edmund, as vice president. Coalescent died just a year later, but Edmund didn't take his place. No president was identified until 1895 when Christina was named. She held the position for five years, the first woman to be president of an incorporated Dayton Brewing Company. Agnes Winter Schwind and Christina Lanton Schwind made another big difference in Dayton's brewing history. They were the first of some important family ties that would see Dayton's brewing industry dominated by a single group of closely intertwined families. Agnes's nephew, Louis Winter, would build one of Dayton's biggest breweries. Christina's sister, Mary Lanton, married someone who would create Dayton's biggest name in brewing, Adam Schantz. Adam Schantz Sr. was born in Germany in 1839. 
He immigrated in 1855 with three brothers. Adam Sr. is pictured here, and at right is a monument to him that overlooks the family plot at historic Woodland Cemetery in Arboretum. Adam was a teenager when he arrived in Dayton, and he was prone to wander. According to his obituary, he soon left Dayton to work in different cities and then found work on a sailing ship for a visit to, his old to the old country. Somehow, somewhere on the ocean, he fell overboard. His story would have ended there, but alert crewmen plucked him from the waves with grappling hooks. Shantz completed his trip and returned to Dayton, where he built a successful meat business. He married Mary Lanton in 1863. He eventually made a fortune in meat, beer brewing, and real estate. He had interest in numerous local businesses, and he began the development of Shantz Park in Oakwood. But in the late 1860s, he was still building his meat business when his youngest brother, George, arrived. George Schantz went to work in Coalesten Schwinn's brewery across Salem and just downstream from Adams Slaughterhouse. He eventually became the brewery's foreman. But in 1882, George bought the slaughterhouse and turned it into his own brewery, the Riverside Brewery. This photo shows the Riverside Brewery in the early 1900s after several expansions. It overlooked the city from the west bank of the Miami River, north of Salem Avenue. The Riverside Brewery was a hit right from the start and it grew rapidly. Its output soon eclipsed the Schwinn's Dayton View Brewery and the Riverside Brewery became a prominent landmark. Now you might think this would have caused a family crisis. Here was Coalesten Schwinn's former foreman, a brother of the man who had, of a, a brother of the man who had married his wife's sister, building another brewery right across Salem Avenue from the Schwind Brewery. But I found no sign of any rift between the Schantzes and the Schwinds. In fact, I found just the opposite. Five years later, George sold his interest in the Riverside Brewery to his brother Adam and teamed up with one of Coalesten's nephews, Louis Schwind. They built yet another new brewery. It was called the Jim City Brewery, and it stood on South Perry Street near where the RTA bus barn is today. And this is a sketch of the Schantz and Schwind Brewing Company. I'm afraid it's not very good, but it's the only image I could find to give us some idea of what it looked like. I mentioned before, <clears throat> I mentioned before that Agnes Winter Schwinn had a nephew named Louis Schwinn, uh, named Louis Winter. Louis Winter went to work as secretary of the Shanson Schwinn Brewery, but in 1901 he quit to start a brewery of his own. Backed by investors, he built the Winter Brewery in just west of the river and south of Albany Street. Now here's the river. Here's Albany Street and there's the Winter Brewery. This was in a new plat that would become known as the Edgemont neighborhood. And to the right is a sketch, again, a, a poor one, I'm afraid, but uh, this shows the Winter Brewing Company. Now remember I said Adam Schantz started out in the meat business. He learned butchering here in Dayton from a man named Michael Olt. Michael Olt's sister, Barbara, later married one of Adam's brothers. One of Michael Olt's nephews went to work at the Riverside Brewery. Another joined the Jim City Brewery and their sister, Mary Eva Olt, married the younger Adam Schantz. So the Olt, Schantz, Schwind, and Winter families became closely intertwined, and so did their brewery, brewery businesses. There were a few Dayton 
breweries outside their circle, but I only have time to mention a couple. One was the Sachs Pruden Brewery. Edward Sachs and David Pruden were both Dayton natives born in the 1850s. Edward developed an interest in drugs and medicinal beverages, especially extracts of ginger root. He went into business with Pruden and their ginger ale extract sold nationwide to druggists and bottlers. In 1888, they decided to brew real ale. They formed the Sachs Pruden Ale Company and built a big new brewery on Wyandotte Street along the canal. In this historical photo, looking north up the canal, the brewery is on the right with a smokestack. Wyandotte was over here out of sight. But Sachs and Pruden may have made a fatal mistake. They brewed ale, but not the far more popular lager beer. The business only lasted a few years. David Pruden quit the brewing business and Edward Sachs spun off his ginger ale work. The building itself survived under later owners who used it for other purposes. It was the home of Howard Music for many years and today it houses Dayton Metro Library offices. This is how it looks today. Of all Dayton's 19th century breweries, Sachs Pruden is the only one whose brew house is still standing. And this where the canal ran is uh, Patterson Boulevard and over to the wider right is Wyandotte Street. And just a couple blocks up from here is, on Wyandotte is the Warped Wing Brewing Company. Another brewery not connected with the Dayton Group is the Holland Camp Brewery. Its story takes us on a short detail through a short detour through Xenia. In 1853, the Xenia Brewery was bought by Henry Fernanding and a partner named Bernard Hollenkamp. Hollenkamp bought out Fernanding's interest in 1857 to become Xenia's sole brewer until his death in 1872. His sons and a nephew, Theodore Hollenkamp, carried on the business for several years until other owners bought it. The Xenia Brewery closed in 1905, but the Holland Camp name became a lasting legacy in Dayton. In 1885, Theodore Holland Camp left Xenia to buy a partnership in a small brewery at Hickory and Brown. He became sole owner 10 years later. And here is the Holland Camp Brewery. And here's Brown Street. And then you can see that it's not very far away from where the Jacob Stickles City Brewery was. <clears throat> when Theodore died in 1901, his family carried on the business, incorporating it as the Holland Camp Brewing Company. Local history buffs might remember the Holland Camp Brewery as one of the few to survive prohibition but I found that Holland Camp also stands out as another woman-run brewery. After Theodore died in 1901, his widow Anna succeeded him as company president until her death in 1907. Their son, Theodore D, succeeded her. He guided the company through prohibition, but his sisters held executive positions. Anna L, the eldest sibling, was vice president from 1919 until uh, until the younger Theodore died in 1935, and then she succeeded him as president. Other Holland Camp sisters served as treasurer and vice president. In fact, Holland Camp women held most of the executive seats. As the world ended, as the world entered the 20th century, Dayton's brewers were feeling more and more competition from outside. Big brands such as Joseph Schlitz in Milwaukee and Budweiser in St. Louis were coming into Dayton's market. New technologies such as pasteurization and refrigerated rail cars extended their reach. In cities around the country, independent brewers moved to protect their hold on local markets by forming combines. I like to say they were circling the brewery wagons. This trend coincided with another change in Dayton. 
The senior Adam Schantz died in 1903, but his son, the younger Adam Schantz, had grown up in family businesses and he took up the reins. In February 1904, he announced Dayton's own brewery combine. It included Adam Schantz Brewing, which owned the Riverside Brewery, Schwind Brewing Company, which owned the Dayton View Brewery, Schantz and Schwind, which owned the Jim City Brewery, Winter Brewing, and Jacob Stickle's City Brewery. At first, Stickle was the only brewer in the combine not connected by family, but Nick Thomas joined in 1906, and Dayton Brewing, the former Saks Pruden Brewery, also eventually joined. The new combine was called the Dayton Breweries Company. Adam Schantz was president, and its headquarters was one of the original tenants of the brand new arcade. Three families intertwined by marriage dominated the new company, the Schantzes, Schwins, and Winners. But what about the Olts? The Olts had had connections with the Schantzes since Michael Olt taught Adam Schantz the meat business half a century earlier. Generations of Olts had been involved in the local meat and brewing businesses. By 1904, when the combine was formed, four Olt siblings were most deeply involved. Mary Eva Olt was married to Adam Schantz Jr., the president of Dayton Breweries, and three of her brothers held management positions or had worked for most of the combine breweries. But no Olt had ever started up a brewery and none held seats on the new company's board of directors. This might have influenced what happened next. In 1906, Charles, William, and Fred Olt broke away from Dayton Breweries to form their own, the Olt Brewing Company. Two more brothers joined them. They built a new brewery in East Dayton on McGee Street between second and third. The new brewery quickly found its place in the local beer market and their flagship beer, Superba, became a popular hit. Yet I never found any evidence of resistance or opposition to this breakaway, either by the combine or by the families. While all this was happening in Dayton, brewers nationwide found themselves facing a common threat. It was the growing prohibition movement. As I wrote in my book, after the old brewery, two world wars would rage and men would walk on the moon before Dayton saw another new brewery. The prohibition movement had been gaining ground for years at the state level, especially in rural counties and smaller towns. Prohibitionists use World War I as a reason to force rationing and fed, and fed sentiment against Germans who dominated the brewing industry. By the end of World War I, Dayton Breweries Inc. was shrinking and closing plants. When national prohibition took hold in 1920, the combine quickly collapsed. Most of Dayton's big breweries were torn down or converted to other uses. The next few years, excuse me, a few brewers struggled through prohibition by selling near beer and soft drinks until brewing resumed when the prohibition ended in 1933. Nick Thomas's old brewery survived as the Miami Valley Brewing Company. It produced Nick Thomas, London Bobby, and Van Beck brands until the 1950s. Old Brewery's Superba beer hung on until 1942, and you can find this building the former old company stable still standing in East Dayton. The Holland Camp sold their brewery around 1940 and their successors kept brewing until the 1960s. But that was the end of brewing in Dayton until the craft beer movement revived it just a decade later. So that's uh, very quickly a look at Dayton's brewing history. Um, and if you're interested in learning more or finding my book, here's where you can find it. It's at Barnes and Noble Books, Booksellers, Carillon Historical Park 
and it's also at the Caroline Brewing Company in the park. You can find it at some of the CV CVS uh, and Walgreens stores. And of course you can find it on amazon.com. Um, and that's, that wraps it up for me. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and I hope. No, you thank you for giving it to us. It was it was as fascinating, and as you were going through it, I'm going, okay, we have to drive to that place on the east side of Dayton to see that building, and yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Okay, mm -hmm. well, thanks for the opportunity, and uh... we do have copies of the book uh, available at Wright Library. And uh, we, uh, we do have a wait list for, for copies, but come and put your holds on if you're interested in reading or go out and support a local author and purchase uh, Dayton beer and learn more about the Miami Valley uh, through beer because it's, it's a very fascinating way to look at a local area. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye. Bye.